When I was in college, I was broke with hella debt from different credit cards, so I decided to start an OnlyFans. I was very reluctant at first. Then I said, you know, forget it. I look good enough to make money, so why not? The first day that I was on there, I made it free to subscribe to me so I could get followers quick and linked all my social medias through Instagram. My OnlyFans was on there also. My Instagram was public, so anyone could get it. I logged on and I started a live stream and a few people got on. Then it was just one person. I wore glasses and the guy told me that I was gorgeous and to take my glasses off. So I did. Then he sent me $10. I told him thank you. Then the message popped up on the screen. You have nice lips. Can you put on red lipstick if you have it? I said, of course. So I got up and I got my lipstick, sat down and I put my lipstick on. Then I was sent $25. I told him thank you. Then he asked, if I give you $100, will you do whatever I say for the next 15 minutes? I told him that I didn't think that, that it was worth it. I was about to log off when he said, no, 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 not yet. What about 300? I gave the same answer. Then he simply put, 1,000 enough for you? I sat there and I thought about it. Then I said, yeah, I'll do it. Then I set an alarm for 15 minutes. The first thing he asked me to do was to blow him a kiss and smile. So I did. Then he told me to say that I love Adam and I said it. At that point, I was thinking that this is pretty easy. Then he asked me, do I have a red dress? I said, yeah. And he, he then asked me to put it on. So I put on the dress and he called me beautiful. Then the weirdest request popped up. It simply said, cry. I asked him what that meant and he said he wants me to cry. So I sat there for a few seconds and I began to try and cry. He typed, no, 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 none of that fake stuff. I want real tears and emotion. I told him that I, I don't know if I can do that. And then he said, well, no money then. I tried again and no luck. He then put $1,500 in the chat. Well, he typed. I said, okay. And I walked into my kitchen, opened the refrigerator door and put my hand inside and closed it as hard as I could. I walked back to my laptop and I began to cry. He put good girl in the chat and then he asked me, do I have scissors? I said, yeah, why? He typed, cut your hair. So I said, no. And then he typed $2,000 in the chat. I paused for a few seconds and I said, okay. I grabbed some scissors, sat back down and then he typed, nah, actually, use a knife, not scissors. Again, I paused and I said, okay. I grabbed a knife, sat down and began to cut my hair and my ponytail was gone. He typed, you look good with short hair. Then he asked me to take my dress off and I said, no. Then he typed 2,500 in the chat and luckily my alarm went off and I told him that his time is up. Then he typed, how about 15 more minutes for $6,000? I said, no. Then he asked, well, do you want these to go public? And then I received 77 photos. I clicked on them and they were from my iCloud. I asked how he'd had my photos and he typed, if you don't do what I say for 15 more minutes, everyone that you know will see these photos. <laughs> I told him, yeah, right. And I closed my laptop. And no lie, a few minutes later, I received over 50 text messages from family and friends that they saw my photos. My landlord told me not to worry about the rent and that he didn't know I was working with a dump truck back there. That I was thicker than a bowl of oatmeal. I don't even know what that means. And after that, honestly, I never went back on the only fans. I went and got a real job, something safer. I became a stripper. But anyway, I changed my whole iCloud and everything. But that was the weirdest night of my life. As a 911 operator, I've heard some pretty strange and terrifying calls over my time, but there is one that still haunts me to this day. It happened about a year ago. It was a normal night shift for me, and I was answering calls as usual. I remember the clock on the wall ticking just past 1am when I received a call that sent chills down my spine. The voice on the other end of the line was a panicked and breathless voice. It was a woman, and she was whispering so softly that I had to strain to hear her. Please, you have to help me, she said. There's someone in my house. I immediately went into professional mode trying to calm her down and get more information. First, I asked, what's your address? Can you tell me where you are? But the woman didn't seem to hear me. She kept whispering about someone being in her house and begging for help. Ma'am, I understand that you're scared in this situation, but I need you to speak up a little bit. I can't help you if I don't know where you are. 
And then something strange happened. The woman stopped whispering and started to speak in a low, almost guttural voice that didn't sound human. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. Was it a prank call or something? A joke being played by one of my co-workers or maybe just some dumb kids? But as I listened, I realised that something was seriously wrong. The woman's voice had changed and there was a strange noise in the background that sounded like growling. I quickly dispatched the police unit to the address. By this time I was able to track the call and where it was coming from, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was very wrong. I could hear the woman on the line still whispering in that strange voice, and I felt like I was losing my mind. Minutes later the police arrived at the address, and I listened in on the radio transmission waiting for any news or an update, but what I heard made me feel even more unnerved. The officers had found the woman, but she was dead. Her body was lying on the floor, and there were signs of a struggle. I felt sick to my stomach wondering how I'd missed the signs that this was a real emergency. Was there something I could have done to save her? As the investigation unfolded, it became clear that the woman had been attacked by something or someone, and they were never caught. The autopsy revealed a strange mark on her body that couldn't be pinned down to one single cause. I couldn't sleep for days after that call. Every time I closed my eyes, I could hear the woman's voice whispering in that low and guttural tone. I started to feel like I was losing my mind, like the trauma of that call had broken something inside of me. It took months of therapy and counselling before I was even able to return to work, and even then, I was never quite the same. I became hypervigilant, always listening for that strange noise or that voice. To this day, I still don't know what happened to that woman, or who or what was responsible for her death but that call will stay with me for the rest of my life. I was late picking my son up from school today. Oh my freaking God! I screamed suddenly, looking at the clock. James and I had agreed that working on home office would be the best way for me to keep track of our children's activities, and now there I was, failing at it. I hurriedly threw my jacket over my pitiful working pyjamas and grabbed the car keys. I'll have to admit, driving... Slightly reckless, the thought of my poor boy sitting all alone in the playground was too hard to bear. Literally one second after I parked the car, the back door was open, and a little blonde boy materialised on his usual seat. Hey mummy! He greeted me cheerfully. His golden hair was covered in sweat despite the cool weather. Hello Tommy! I smiled back. At least his clothes weren't muddied. Too much running around today? Just a little, he replied, and started drawing furiously on a colouring book. And when I say furiously, I mean it literally. Tommy was making holes with the crayons across the pages. Was five supposed to be a strange age? His older sister was the most quiet, easygoing girl during kindergarten. I couldn't believe it's been over five years. Maybe it's because he's a boy. Boys are always difficult. Mummy, I'm hungry. What's for dinner? Oh, crap. James used his day off today to spend the day with our six-month-old at his mother's house so I could get some work done. Making dinner was the last thing on my mind. I texted my husband on a red light. Tommy was still using his crayons to destroy the colouring book, but at least he was quiet. Don't worry, baby, I'll bring food from Mom, was his reply. Great, now my delightful mother-in-law knew I wasn't able to work, take care of my children and feed my family at the same time. A horrible thought crossed my mind. Why did we even have three? I always said I only wanted two kids. Mum, I'm so hungry, Tommy said again. We still had a while before dinner, so I stopped by a famous fast food drive through and got him a burger, absent-mindedly. When we finally got home, I unpacked the car and noticed Timmy had only eaten the meat, leaving bread, pickles and cheese behind. Ugh, the picky eater face. I left Tommy playing downstairs and headed to my office. If I hurried, I could get all my work done before James and our baby girl were back. My oldest was at our neighbour's, getting some school project done. God bless the Davisons and their well-behaved daughter who's good friends with mine. Just one more hour, you can do it, I psyched myself. After putting on some classical music on the headphones, I immersed myself on work. My hungry stomach hurting was the only thing that made me realise that a lot of time had passed. For the second time that day, I cursed out loud because I'd lost track of time. It was 10pm. Why the fuck didn't James come and fetch me for dinner when he got home? I went downstairs angrily, but I stopped dead in my tracks as soon as I realised the smell. But despite the metallic and bitter scent, nothing could prepare me for the carnage on my very living room. James and my two daughters were completely mangled, their blood and guts all scattered, their eyes and part of their viscera were missing. 
I'll never know if they screamed before being ripped apart, but I'm assuming they didn't, or else the police would have been called by the neighbours, unless the neighbours were eaten too. Tommy said he was hungry, and then I realised, I don't know any Tommy. I don't even have a son. For a few months, I worked a night shift at a 24-hour gas station in northern West Virginia. It was a Wednesday night. It started like any other normal shift at work, any day of the week. A few people stopped in here and there, mainly buying lottery tickets and paying for gas. Forward it a few hours, it was 3am and the traffic had died down a little bit. I was sitting up front when I watched a maroon Lincoln sedan pull into the parking lot and park in the back behind all the gas pumps. It was a couple of minutes later when a woman emerged from the front passenger seat who sort of stumbled out of the car and started approaching the gas station. I watched her as she walked in at a rather brisk pace, in a very nervous kind of fashion. I instantly noticed that her face was pale and she had sweat perspiring on her forehead. Mind you, it was the dead of winter and I'm pretty sure that the temperature was below zero degrees that night. She walked past the counter and headed straight towards the back to the bathrooms. She came out about five minutes later and her body language was really starting to concern me. She was kind of pacing back and forth in the aisles, occasionally peeking her head around and looking out the windows towards the car. Right as I thought about saying something, she walked right out of the door and headed in the direction towards the car that was parked across the lot. About five minutes went by and the car didn't move. But then suddenly the car went into reverse and did a 180 towards the gas pumps and parked beside one. The car was much closer now so I was able to see the woman inside who was accompanied by a man in the front seat. Another minute went by, then the passenger door sprung open and the woman who previously came in began walking towards the building again. This time, when she walked by, it was becoming more and more obvious to me that something was wrong. She walked towards the counter, holding a $20 bill, and said, 20 on pump 5, in a quiet, shaky voice. I took it and continued to watch her body language, seeing that her hands were clenched in a fist, in addition to the sweat on her forehead. I looked at her with concern, and I think she noticed it on my face, not trying to make it obvious in case the man outside was watching me, I, w I said to her, is everything all right? And she looked up at me, not saying a word for at least five seconds, until she replied, yes, thank you. I didn't buy it, and continued to question her, saying, do you know who that guy is in the car? And she responded with, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's my, that's my boyfriend. I didn't believe any of this to be true, and I watched as she approached the car, right as she opened the passenger's door. The man handed her something and she grabbed it and promptly turned backwards towards the building. She walked in and instantly went to the chip aisle where she paced around again and eventually bought a bag of chips to the counter. I was finally able to make out what the man had handed her. It was a $5 bill. I looked at her again with concern but didn't want to continue badgering her. Also acknowledging the possibility of her temperament being from an argument or something. She slapped it down on the counter then did something I never would have expected. She leaned in and reached towards the lighters, which are close to the back of the counter by me, and faintly muttered under her breath, I need help. Those words raised the hairs on the back of my neck and confirmed my suspicions. I casually replied, acting like I was ringing her out, and said, Do you want me to call the police? And she nodded her head. I pressed the panic button that was located under the counter, which alerted 911 of an emergency. Right after doing so, I looked up and I noticed that the girl was heading towards the exit. I ran around the counter and went straight for the door, just as she was about to walk out. I told her to stop and locked the door before she could leave. She instantly started crying and was clearly in shock from the whole situation. She kept repeating these words that still give me chills just thinking about it to this day. He's going to get mad. He's going to get mad. I told her to follow me and I took her to the back room where I deadbolted the lock shut, locking us both inside. I assured her that the police were on their way and everything was going to be okay. I had no choice but to remain calm in the situation because if I didn't, I knew she would freak out even more. However, the sheer feeling of panic continued to grow when the man suddenly started pounding on the outside door of the gas station, screaming the girl's name. This occurrence was enough to send her into total shock and she just sat down and became completely emotionless and silent. The pounding lasted for another few minutes until it finally grew quiet. I didn't know if the man had broken through or what, but I wasn't going to go out there and find out. A couple of minutes after that, the police arrived, kicked the back door down, and eventually we came out. I was instantly separated from the girl who got picked up in an ambulance. 
I was taken to the police station to give a statement where I explained everything that happened. After that, I was sent home for the rest of the night and I didn't hear anything until a couple of weeks later. I found out online that the woman was being trafficked that night. She had been kidnapped about 45 minutes away in a Walmart parking lot. The article gave a description and a sketch of the suspect which looked a lot like the guy I saw the night in the car. Apparently the driver was heading south to wherever he was planning on taking her. The woman was able to convince the man to pull over so she could use the restroom. While he was there, he sent the girl back in to pay for the gas. The girl must have convinced him to get, let her get a snack, which explains why she came in the third time after she realised I could possibly help her. I've neither heard or spoken to this girl since that day. I don't consider myself to be a hero by any means, but I'm so glad that I was in the right place at the right time. I'm still a little shook from that night, even to this day. But I just hope that the victim of this horrific crime is doing okay. I used to work as a pizza delivery driver. I would only work on Wednesdays, Fridays and Saturdays. I always preferred the weekend shifts, especially at night time, because that's when I would make the most money. At this point, I've been working there for the past year and had come to know many of the regular customers that I delivered to. On one particular Friday, I had just gotten back from a delivery when my boss handed me another box of pizza to deliver. I instantly recognised the address seeing that it was a lady who almost religiously ordered pizza every Friday. According to my manager, she'd been doing it for years. On that job, I've learnt that a lot of customers like to chit-chat, and this lady was one of them, but I didn't mind her because she was always very kind and would often tip me very generously. She lived on her own and would always tell me she enjoyed having the house to herself, since it was quiet. Her house was ten minutes away from the shop, so I got in my car and I drove straight there. It was around 11 o'clock at night, which is usually the same time she'd always order. As soon as I got there, I pulled into the driveway, parking behind a red Kia Optima. The first thing I noticed was that her porch light wasn't on, which was unusual because she always had it on in the past. I assumed she must have just forgotten to turn it on. As I was approaching the house on the walkway to the door, I instantly froze in my steps. When I looked up, I realised that the front door was wide open. There were no visible lights coming from anywhere inside the house. It was completely dark. Hesitantly, I took a few more steps forward and stepped up onto the front porch where I leaned my head in towards the entrance and yelled, Hello, is anyone home? I waited a few seconds but got no response. After seeing that the front porch light was off, I didn't really find anything else too strange, but after noticing the fully open front door and complete darkness inside the house, I was really starting to get scared. I found it quite hard to believe that all those strange signs were just a coincidence. As a last hope, before I escalated the situation by telling my boss, I stepped inside the house and began calling for her. In retrospect, <laughs> this probably wasn't a good idea, but I walked around the first floor of the house looking for any signs of her. My only explanation at this point was that she had a medical emergency of some sort and needed help. I made my way into the kitchen where I found another red flag. Her phone was sitting on the countertop right next to the sink and her car keys were on the coat rack by the front door. Other than that, there were no signs of her. I thought about checking the upstairs level, but I started to get freaked out. I ran back to my car where I called my boss and while waiting for him to answer, I started getting really worried as I soaked in everything I'd just witnessed. I got a nauseated feeling in my stomach that something was seriously wrong. My boss finally picked up and I stumbled over my words, trying to tell him that I think something bad has happened to her. He told me just to come back to the shop and talk to him more about it because he was really busy with customers. I sped back as fast as I could where I practically ran in to attempt to tell him everything in a less panic tone. After talking with him, he agreed that we should contact the police and have them send over someone for a welfare check. Well, weeks went by and we heard absolutely nothing from the police. The suspense and ominous tension was killing me, not knowing what happened. Several more weeks went by, which turned into years. I eventually quit that job and worked my way up into the career job I have today. Last month, by coincidence, I ran into my old boss from the pizza shop, who struck up a conversation for a little, before I finally brought up the elephant in the room. I said, Hey, whatever happened to that girl? His expression quickly changed into a blank look, and he sighed. 
<sighs> I don't know. She hasn't ordered a pizza since that night. Later that day, I decided to drive over to the house I delivered to that night. There was a truck and a car parked in the driveway, and a lady sitting outside while her kids were playing in the yard. I parked on the street and walked up to the driveway, waving at her. I said, hey, I know this is kind of a weird question to ask, but do you know anything about the previous owner of this house? She looked puzzled as she replied, no, no, not at all. Our realtor just said that the house had been abandoned for a year before we moved in. I politely thanked her and walked back to my car with that same feeling I had in my gut years ago, the last time I was at that house. I still can't believe that after all these years, I still have no idea what happened to her. She just dropped off the face of the planet. I'm hoping that there's some logical explanation for this that I'll eventually find one day, but I just hope that she's doing okay.